fairly mild sign. Um, so I just got a really wonderful question, which is the question I always get in these materials, is how do you go to 3D without uh, having the material expose everywhere? Uh, if I just focus a beam into this material, like I did uh, for these waveguides here, uh, uh, it's a one photon material. Why doesn't it just polymerize everywhere? So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, and uh, so this is, this is just adding, and looking at that termination species and, and what can we do with it. But are people familiar with two photon excitation of materials? I realize I don't have my mic on. That's probably going to screw up the uh, cord here. Um, we'll be talking about two photon photopolymerization basically. Awesome. Um, so, in 3D, of course. Yes. So you can do many of the same things uh, with one photon polymerization. And that might be one of the other sort of important messages here. Um, and of course, you worry about confinement. Two photon gives you small confinement, gets you rejection of out of focus exposure. But in two photon, you worry about having to have a hundred thousand dollar laser uh, to even get started because of the very small cross section. Sorry, it's a typically good one photon, two photon fight here. Um, <laughs> so we we stick entirely to one photon and try to manipulate chemistry to get us what we want. The two photon approach uses a different uh, different idea to get to small features and 3D control. So here's a way I'm going to show you right now of getting to small features, 3D control. Um, my fourth lecture I'll talk about getting down to sub 100 nanometer, 50 nanometer control, well beyond the optical diffraction of light, um, with one photon chemistry. And why that might be interesting is it's cheap and fast. And so if you're talking to industrial people, data storage, something like that, um, then that's cool. So you remember I said that this, this inhibiting or terminating species was interesting because it made things small. So as an engineer, that's what I focus on. Let's just sort of cartoon-like think about uh, inhibition or thresholding. Let's say I get some bump of light. It's a focus, it's a part of the hologram up here, just a bump of light somewhere in space. And I'm doing lithography, and with lithography, I like to make things small. Well, maybe I can dump some chemical in there, and I can look up those chemicals. Um, and what that chemical would do is it would inhibit the reaction from happening until I got a certain amount of light to put in the material. So now I get some trade-off uh, of size and how much uh, change I get in the material. But if I was to dump more and more of this inhibiting species uh, into the material, pushing this threshold up, ooh, I get a smaller feature. Exciting! But I also get a lot less chemical change. Conversion of monomer is the formal phrase. Less monomer turns into polymer. So this is a game you do play in two-photon stereolithography, for example. Um, is you, you dial your intensity down to you just can have the uh, polymer you make survive the solid wash. Um, but it's clear there's sort of diminishing returns here. So it's, it's, this curve's getting flat. So if I push this threshold on uh, higher and higher up, I do make smaller and smaller features. But eventually I'm doing lithography in general. Um, it just, it's, not, it's not stiff, robust feature. What if somehow I could change the shape of this spatial profile of thresholding, and I could threshold a lot at the wings and not in the middle? Well, now as I now push this threshold up, indeed, I make a smaller feature, but I'm not getting any penalty on how strong a feature and how much chemistry I get to do at the focus. This would be a cool thing, and is pretty much on the top. Um, I guess you can do this. And I'll talk about two different ways of doing it, one now, one in my fourth lecture. Before I do that, I have to go back to doing chemistry again for a minute um, and tell you the bill. Um, and this might be relevant for, for discussions of two photons as well. Um, and what I lied about is the, one of these rate equations. I'm going to have to add a term here. Um, so this is radicals being generated. Um, and they, inter they get generated by optical intensity interacting with the dye um, that splits it in half and makes radicals. Uh, they maybe uh, get terminated by some species. I like that. I'm going to use this. But they also do something else. Radicals typically, well, yeah, they're difficult. Uh, you split some molecule apart. A radical, in case you don't know your chemistry, is if I've got a single uh, bond, this is the most common way to make them homolytic cleavage. So, uh, that, that's two atoms sharing electrons. They're each giving one electron right, to the bond. So if I split those apart, I'm left with one electron on each of these species. This is not an ion, necessarily. It's just something that's got an unpaired electron in its outer shell. 
And if you remember your beginnings of chemistry, one unpaired electron in an outer shell is one of the most active chemical species you can have, and that's why they're good for going off and doing polymerization. But what they're really good at is finding each other and joining back up. Um, and so they will find each other and join back up, reducing the density of these. In other words, the radicals themselves, you notice these two terms look just the same, the radicals themselves are pretty efficient terminators or inhibitors. Why do you care? It turns out, this, and, and radicals, by the way, are the most common initiator. Almost all two folks are initiators, or radical uh, initiators. They're just so easy to make and so easy to work with. There are other species, but they're the most common. Let's do our steady state assumption again. Assume that during the exposure, maybe the radical density doesn't change too much, and look what happens. Let's ignore this like I did before, and like I did before, solve for the density of radicals, and I can see, just take it to the other side of the equation, the density of radicals is going to be proportional to the density. Yay! But let's say, let's ignore this term. Let's say it does not dominate, and really I've got a lot of this going on, this bimolecular termination. Well, now when I solve for the density of radicals in terms of the intensity, it's going to be a square root. I mentioned that every process in this system hates you, it works against you, for engineer. This is another one of them. Um, because, I'll say a phrase to make the physicist wince, the material responds like a half photon material. There's a such thing as half photon. Uh, but the point is, the uh, response of the material goes as the square root of intensity, if this term's completely missing. And that's really not friendly. That's exactly like what photon gives you, only backwards. Right? Uh, makes features broader. Um, so this is something you have to pay attention to when you're working with photopolymers in general, as a matter of fact. Um, and you can go off and check this, because it seems like it just doesn't make sense. You don't believe your chemists, so you go off and check it. Um, you can make materials, I don't think, one minute. I guess it's right here. Um, so what you find is, what I just said, is you can get from linear dependence down to a square root dependence. And so the typical way of characterizing this is to say, oh, uh, the material responds like intensity raised to some power alpha, ranges from one uh, to as low as one half. For a two photon response, uh, ideal response, it would be alpha equals two. You can then go off and mix materials where you know uh, what this is. Um, cationic, a different kind of initiator, you know, as a matter of fact, is, is uh, linear. And what and then what these are is much like the samples were passed around. I've taken a, a focused beam, the light was going left to right here, and I've dragged it into the screen uh, and then gone off and looked at the result. I did it multiple times just so I could find myself. Uh, looked at the result on a uh, phase contrast microscope. So this is a copy of the Gaussian beam that was sliding into the screen. And I can then do the same integration in the computer. It's trivial. And I can sort of at least visually compare these and go, yeah, it looks about right. And what I see here is indeed in these radical materials, this feature this feature is exactly the same NA and then same same laser wavelength. But for the radical, the features are bigger. Right? And again, nature hates you. It turns out if you really do some weird things, you can drive alpha less than one half and you get to the topsy turvy land where the material responds more weakly to high intensities than it does to low intensities. Basically, you're creating so many uh, uh, radicals here that it terminates itself and shuts down. And by golly, you can make that happen too. Um, I don't know what that's good for, um, but it's, it's interesting. So the point is we have to worry about the, this is called sublinear initiation kinetics. Uh, that this is not one and that's not friendly. Now I'll show you if you're clever, I think I'm clever, um, you can actually make this your friend, uh, but you have to work at it a little bit. Okay, I'm going to come back to these constants again and discuss them a little bit more. Basically the same material again, but I think it's important, so I'm going to show you different pictures. Um, because we can use these, if we're, if, again, if we, we work with our chemists, uh, we can use these to do good stuff. <coughs> so uh, the curves in the background here are actual full uh, numerical solutions to those rate equations, uh, and we'll use that to understand what's going on. Let's say this is the monomer uh, reaction diffusion coefficient, um, and it's bigger than one, and that says diffusion is faster than the materials get eaten up. This is a single bump of a sinusoid, and there's the period of the sinusoid, um, and what I'm looking at is the growth of polymer as a function of time going up here. So it starts out with polymer zero, then the polymer grows, and this is going to be copied by the Lorentz Lorentz relationship into the index of refraction. If monomer diffuses quickly, this number's big, monomer diffuses quickly, um, I never dig a hole in the monomer concentration, sketched in here in the straight line, and therefore the polymerization rate pretty much just echoes the optical intensity, and this thing looks like a sinusoid. It's the high fidelity. If, on the other hand, um, and I can, I can change this number by changing the diffusion coefficient of my material, 
by increasing the rate of polymerization, that's turning my laser intensity up, right? Because laser intensity just affects the rate of polymerization. So I can dial this number around in a lot of different ways, spatial scale intensity. So I dial it down on the other side of one. So now diffusion is slow. So now, as well, this is just a sketch, but uh, as time goes on, I begin to develop a hole in my monomer. So I start out, this is a normalized time, with this polymer starting to grow, it looks pretty good, but all of a sudden, it starts to get broad, it seems to get flat here, and eventually it actually develops that double hump that I showed you before for the hologram case, the sort of walls. And the reason is monomer is diffusing in and it ain't getting all the way in. Or it's actually just, it maybe it's getting somewhere, somewhere in, but a lot of it's piling up on the edges. So that's um, but, it turns out exactly the same kinetics happens to the terminator, which is the reason uh, we define that correlation, but for some reason that's not flying over. Um, so, let's say that I'm going to stick in the same two cases of uh, reaction limited, is what this is called, a diffusion limited uh, monomer chemistry. Um, but now I'm going to look at what happens if I also have mobile inhibitor. Um, so why am I doing this? Because, well, the inhibitor is just important. I like it, I can do stuff with it, so I just want to explore what it does. Um, and it turns out that once I discovered this and wrote a paper on that, somebody pointed out to me about 1960, guys in the lithography industry had figured this out first, um, because guys in the lithography industry were paid a whole lot of money to figure out how to make small features. And so they learned the same trick. Uh, so, oops. Um, so what happens? Um, let's say I've got monomer music moving quickly, so uh, my monomer concentration stays uniform. But I start to eat a hole in my, my inhibitor, my terminator, so pretty soon I have no inhibitor on axis, but I've got it off on the edges. My polymer can now grow more quickly in the middle, it's pretty much shut down at the edges, and I get these narrow features. Again, this is a full numerical solution. Well, that's exciting. Um, and I'm looking at all four cases here, but if now I have both monomer and inhibitor slow, it starts, it starts out uh, that I get narrow features, and in the long term, uh, the monomer uh, kinetic swings and, and uh, the feature gets big. This is the one I care about. And sort of looking at reaction diffusion rates of monomer and inhibitor, I find that if I've got monomer fast and inhibitor slow, I get narrower things. And that tells me how to go in and, and mock with my chemistry to get into this quadrant uh, of reactions. Oh, so would you go and ask me how I made the dishes? Um, I was just asked, how did I make this little guy? So, um, we put this sample uh, up on the 3D stage, um, and we pointed a, a spatially filtered uh, solid state laser at it with lots of optics missing, but the basic idea is made of pencil. And we've got right here a focus and a degree. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to move the sample around. Of course, this focus is most intense in all three dimensions uh, on, on the uh, axis. My PowerPoint uh, doesn't quite do that justice, but you know that uh, the uh, light is uh, confined and falls off in various ways from the focus. So we're just going to move the sample around on the stage and do a 3D etch a sketch, basically. Uh, right? We're going to do three dimensional direct light photography. Wherever I touch the material with light, I'm going to get the index to go up. And it's going to go up approximately equal to the intensity. Everything I've been talking about is the world word approximately, how we feel about that. Um, but we don't really know where we are, so we need to add some, some bits to this. So we'll add a confocal microscope, if you know that uh, technology in the red. That'll allow us to look down into this material and find, for example, where are these boundaries, which would be a nice thing to know. It also allows us to find some other things we're going to put in there soon. And because we want to see more of what's going on there, we'll add a third or second, second microscope. Uh, this is basically is a microscope developed by one of my students. It's like a confocal transmission microscope, or a confocal reflection microscope, excuse me, but it operates in transmission, sees different parts of the object. And that turns out to be really handy. So, basic idea is operating in green with this particular material sensitive, we'll get it bright, and in the red, we'll have some sensing going on. Red photons are too low energy to initiate the chemistry. What can we do? Well, primarily, we could do one of two things. We could move the sample up and down, and so now we have uh, material dragging perpendicular to the direction of propagation of light. Those pictures I showed at the beginning uh, of, the, of the different alphas uh, were done that way. Or I could primarily, I can see them wherever I want, but just to sort, of sort things out, I could primarily move the material uh, parallel to the direction of propagation. I'm only going to talk about this one because it's simpler, um, though all the same thing applies to the top one. So what's going to happen? Now, 
Let's put this all together. Why can we go in and write uh, two or three or four micron features down in this material and have only have response happen at the focus and not have response happen everywhere else? Because that's what you normally think you need to use to put on for. So putting all the different bits together, and I'll show you the results of a lot of calculation, I've got some inhibitor, this terminating species running around in there. I'm going to move the material, let's say I'm going to move the material opposite of that arrow. Uh, I'm going to move it from the right towards the left. And as I do, I'm going to be encountering this bright intense focus and all of the out focus parts. Originally, the material does not respond at all because I've got this inhibitor. As the material moves towards the focus, I start chewing up the inhibitor until eventually it's gone, and then the material starts to respond. And what that gives me to lower your uh, light is this. I can eat up all the inhibitor on axis, leaving the inhibitor uh, elsewhere, because this is where the light is, and that's what chews up the inhibitor. And so I can, with just one beam, both create this profile of inhibition, and then right in the hole that I made. Now, I've got to watch my time scales. I've got, I'm using one knob, this optical intensity, to do multiple things. So I've got to be kind of careful about that. This is the result of all that calculation. If it causes your eyes to glaze over, fine, I'll just go on. Um, but we end up with now a two-parameter model. This is a sort of normalized inhibition threshold. It's zero if there's no inhibition. It's one <coughs> if the integrated intensity is exactly equal to that level. It's shut off everything in the material. So zero, no inhibition, one, very strong inhibition. The material is moving down, just to change coordinate system to see if you're still awake. Uh, material motion moving down. And the focus is sitting right here. Up here, as the material moves down, it hasn't seen enough light yet, I'm completely inhibited. But as I move down, eventually I hit a point, like right here, where I've chewed up all my inhibitor, and now the material is no longer inhibited. And from inside this little mask, this is like a local near-field mask I can create on the material in 3D. Um, I now have inside this shell now material which is photosensitive. And if I put more and more inhibitor in there, that shell gets smaller. This is in scales of, this is for a calculator for a Gaussian beam, in scales of the diffraction limit and spot size. And you see that these things, these, the size of these shells, how much I'm restricting the response to the focus, are getting to be somewhere in the range of the diffraction limit and spot size, but not a whole lot smaller. And as a matter of fact, I can make a plot of uh, what's the maximum radius that I, I, outside these shells, nothing ever happens. So out here, for example, out here, nothing ever happens. I do not get any response. Um, and so I can make a plot of what that radius is uh, as a function of how strongly I inhibit. If there's no inhibition, then the radius is infinite. Um, if, there's, if I inhibit everything, well, then the radius is zero. That's kind of the trade-off I had before. But in between, there's kind of something interesting that happens. If I throw away half of my light creating this shell, then it turns out that I have a waveguide written material which is exactly W naught in radius. So I can get myself, for penalty of using half my light to create my, my, my mask, in return for that, I can, in a one photon process, I can operate right at the diffraction limit in 3D. I think that's cool. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. And again, if you didn't follow this, here it is again, maybe, maybe better, maybe not. Um, all I'm just talking about is, is sort of this, and this is simplified, and this is a really simplified model that makes my chemist friends wince. But it's a way, as an engineer, I can figure out what I want the material to do. Um, so if I have, so this is the same picture again, again, turn back on its side to you know, keep your head broken. Um, uh, the color plot is a Gaussian beam. This is Raleigh ranges here. This is radius. Uh, W knots um, right here. The material is moving right to left. Out here it's inhibited, and then at some point it overcomes the inhibition, and inside this profile, oh, um, uh, we have uh, overcome the inhibition, so the material will respond. So now we can then go off and calculate uh, what uh, the index profile will look like as a function of this other thing we had to worry about, which was the sublinear initiation of these radical photopolymers. Um, gee, I thought there was a oh. 
Um, so, if I inhibit strongly, these profiles, these masks get narrower. But what I just talked about was uh, if I have a, I need to get clear what this parameter is, but it, it's, it's zero, no inhibition, one complete inhibition, one half was what I just talked about. It goes right through the middle of my focus. So the front half of my focus is used up in eating the inhibitor, and then the back half is used in writing, and I only write inside this little flying column. So for a linear material, I can now integrate the Gaussian beam inside this little flying cone, and if the material is linear, just for a minute, that then should predict what my index profile looks like. And so I get this set of in, uh, potential waveguide profiles, because I'm interested in waveguides. Uh, for a little inhibition, capital A equals 0.1, I get this big bra thing. This is the thing that people worry about whenever they see this sample. And you can see that even if I had no inhibition, uh, I do get a big broad profile. Um, this is Gaussian radii here, so it's getting pretty broad. But it is still localized, because Gaussian mean is localized on axis. But if I include even a small amount of inhibition, all of a sudden, it does not respond at all outside, in this case, 2W0. And then, oh, I'll put it back. So that's kind of cool. Good so far? 20's good. That's why I said good. Not. He's trying to. Um, okay. But, oh God, uh, I just told you that these polymers do not respond linear. They may respond sublinear. Well, what does that do? Well, if the material, it doesn't, it doesn't affect this inhibition process at all. It only affects what happens inside the little cone where the material is free of inhibitor. So, power point magic again. Um, if the material starts to get less and less linear in its response, this point doesn't change. It's just that. It, it, it's, it's like you're trying to blow up a balloon, but you've constrained the edges. The edges are constrained by this inhibition. It's trying to make a bigger and bigger profile inside this threshold. And what happens, in case you missed that profile, I'm not going to do it again, um, is the profile sticks the same radius. It just starts to get more binary. I like that. I really like that as an optical engineer. Because that little corner there is what gives me tightly confined. And the piece of physics I haven't put in here because it is the hard one to model, actually. Um, this is getting a little bit silly. We don't look quite that bad, but oh yeah, it's neat. Um, is, there's also saturation going on in these materials. You, and I'll show you some data on that. They run up against the maximum index change they can make and they stop. It's hard to model that because there's, everything is going large signal there. There's the analytic approximations you can make very hard to make. But it tends to say that one could make a material which does not respond out of a certain place, outside of a certain place, then sharply responds inside a certain radius, goes up to a threshold, hits that, goes straight across, goes back down. In other words, a completely binary response material in 3D with one photon speed. And that's beginning to be the way kind of thing you often do cool applications over there. <laughs> so this is a uh, sort of Vogue photo, uh, that sample that I have right here. Um, we wrote uh, the name of our for our group in it. Um, if you zoom in on this, by the way, zooming in on the picture, um, you can see that these waveguides look like they're tapered. And they are, because the thing I haven't mentioned, of course, is the dye, the absorber, well, it absorbs. Um, and so actually, in this orientation, we wrote from the, the screen side out here, they're a little bit weaker in back and a little bit stronger in front, because the material, though optically thin, absorbs about half the light as we go through. Turns out we can now put it on a photography card version of power correction. It changes the power dynamically as it writes, knows how deep it is. We can make that go away. Um, that scanning transmission in focal microscope I mentioned, here's results from it. Um, those are what those waveguides look like uh, in terms of profile. They're about seven microns across. Notice the little dark holes here. Still haven't figured out why they're a triangle pattern. Bonus points if anyone can explain that to me. But the dark regions around them is again that null where the, 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 the diffusion is pulled material in the center, and so we see a little valley at the edge, and that's actually good. And then this is, I think, just this is a brand new result. I'm terribly, terribly excited about it. Here's yet a third uh, way of measuring these waveguides. This is the same uh, system I showed before, except instead of an OFDR over here, I've simply made the material so thick uh, it gets rid of all the back reflections uh, in the confocal filter. 
Um, so I send some light in, I bounce it off the glass polymer surface, I take that back through a controllable filter onto a noise canceling detector, being careful with noise in this. I now scan back and forth across this glass boundary to check that I know what I'm doing. I first look at a fiber. This is now a single mode telecom fiber. Um, you can see the whole fiber, there's the core. We measured a 0.357% index contrast, the manufacturer spec is 0.36, so we think we're better well calibrated. And now we can look at one of these waveguides. This is a real index here, uh, actually calibrated. See a little bit of stripes in here, because we're still getting our motion control perfectly synced to our detectors. But this is the good bits. Um, the light profile here is the profile uh, of this waveguide in radius. It goes to no index change at all outside plus or minus 10 microns. Could fit that two parameter model, the sublinear kinetics of the initiation, how much threshold is going on, to uh, this measured profile. The fit comes up with these numbers. These are what we get from uh, other experiments. Uh, so we're pretty happy that uh, it is making sense. You can then take that index profile that you measured with your microscope, and you can run it through a mode solver and calculate what mode diameter uh, it, what, what should support as a mode. So it should be a five micron mode diameter. And you go off and measure that with a good beam profile, and you get the same answer. And that kills the heck out of you. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, uh, you can look at the peak delta M, almost 10 to the minus 2. So pretty strong index response in these things. Um, and this is one we haven't really worked hard on making the model. So to some extent, this, this is like one of the hoo slides of the talk, because you really can reach down. You can control what these shapes are uh, with a model that is highly oversimplified from the chemistry, but it's got apparently enough of the right parameters that it does predict what's going on. It can get you no response outside of a certain radius, get some narrowing, and you can measure it, and it all makes sense. Okay. Uh, now, that, was, that model had the diffusion so slow for the inhibitor that it wasn't moving at all. In other words, you carved a hole in it and just stayed there. So that's the limit of diffusion speed for the inhibitor was zero. What if it actually does move? And it turns out you need to think about this because well, it does. Oxygen is what we're using as the inhibitor here, because uh, again, graduate students uh, resist holding their breath in the lab. Um, it's small. And it moves fast. And so it's really hard. You have to work hard to get into that regime where that previous model worked. So, what if it does move? Well, so here's, you've seen this plot before. Um, this is, now here's my, my two reaction diffusion coefficients. My monomer is moving fast, uh, 50, much faster than, than uh, it's, it's diffusing. My terminator, I'm sort of right in the boundary. It's moving not fast and not slow. It turns out there's an interesting Goldilocks spot here in between those two. What happens? Uh, this is now looking at polymer building up as a function of space, single sinusoidal bump here, could be like the model holograms, as a function of now time developing on. First, there's no polymer, then polymer starts to develop what looks like a sinusoidal bump, then it flattens out, then it develops this characteristic hole in the middle. This is what the terminator, the inhibitor, is doing. I'm using those terms interchangeably. I apologize to the chemists and I don't write the same, uh, but I'm using them interchangeably. I started out with some indiffused level of oxygen, some finite uh, uniform level of terminator, and I very quickly carved a hole in that where the light was bright. And then the hole got broader and broader and broader um, as the exposure went on. And what you can't see here, but I'll show you next, is right about this area, uh, I'm showing three of these units, a little bit larger than one. Something new happens. This is kind of the model I just showed you. This is not inhibited, I'd be inhibited on the edge. But what if I start to let the terminator diffuse some? Let, if it, if it does on its own. Well then I first carve this hole and stuff, and then it begins to diffuse in. And what happens if it diffuses in? It stays, this profile, this mask that I've made, stays narrower, and that keeps my polymer narrower, and I like that. In other words, a moving inhibitor actually can give you narrower features than a static one. And that turns out to be the thing that the semiconductor guys discovered. Um, so, if I can show you this plot, uh, you can get through it, and then I'll show you the experimental validation of it to the best you're able to do. This is a fully numerical model, um, and so now, because you've got a computer, uh, you run it over a, you, you pick fast monomer, because there are no fast diffusing monomers, the interesting case. And then you look as a function of development time, and this uh, coefficient coming out of the terminator modes. Uh, and you take a look at the full width half max across there of the feature. 
And these units, the diffraction limit is one half. So out here, for a very, very fast moving uh, terminator, our T is 10 to the fourth, you always keep the terminator completely uniform. You just, that uh, just sinks, you never cover a hole, so you operate as if it really wasn't there, uh, and you operate at the diffraction limit. If the terminator moves really, really slow, let's see. Uh, what happens there? Um, in, the, in the intermediate range, though, something interesting happens. Uh, notice the scale here. This white region right across here, and, uh, this, this slice right across there is an interesting one. It, it, you have to be a little careful on units on these things, sort of where the intermediate region is. In this set of units, at RT, this, this unitless coefficient of around 200. Um, all of a sudden, you find that you're operating at about full width half max at around 0.2. Uh, that's pretty, that's somewhat significantly smaller than the diffraction limit. And it's, it's smaller than you even get for, let's see, yeah. Uh, if you go this way, so let's say, uh, at some particular time, let's say 0.1 or 0.05, uh, I'm operating at the diffraction limit of my final feature size. And if I move across here, I find that there's some particular diffusion rate of this stuff which causes my feature to get narrower, narrower, and then I go back to the diffraction limit. In other words, because you may not be following me, if you tune the diffusion rate of this terminator, you can end up making this mask narrower by about a factor of two, maybe a little bit more, theoretically. Again, highly simplified model, but factors of two, at least in the lithography world, are pretty exciting. So let's say, I think I just said a lot. Monomer two. Kinetics tend to broaden the feature. Uh, really, really slow uh, uh, diffusion kinetics, which is what I just showed you, tend to narrow it. Somewhere in the middle, there's actually a magic thing that happens. You can actually get even a little bit narrower. This takes probably too much um, tuning of your chemistry. Um, so the best we've gotten to measure in this is we created a setup with a acoustic optic deflector back here, so we could create two independent, incoherent spots in front of our lens. And then what we did is we wrote a series of lines, in each case the material is sliding through and out of the page. So we wrote this set first, then that set, then that set, with a full simulation. And what you notice, well we noticed, maybe you'll notice, because um, we had to stare at it for a while, um, is this guy's pretty weak in comparison to that. This is a microscopic image, phase image. Uh, why is this weak? Because we're just above the emission threshold. There's all sorts of oxygen in this sample, and so we are just above it. When we move down here, the reason these are stronger is there's this huge oxygen current running upward. We dug a hole in the oxygen up here. Um, so by the time, even about two seconds later, 35 microns uh, in space, we got to here, there was less oxygen here, even though no light ever touched this. You can see what this shape looks like. And that's because the oxygen here was already lower because it was running up to fill in that hole. So you can probe these currents and you can see them. And the reason we created two foci was to start looking at spreading them apart and to be able to basically make a differential measurement uh, of what that curve is. It's with uh, these DIC images, that's a little bit hard. So the hypothesis is that the reason you see weak to strong, the reason you say, see, see, these are asymmetric, you get a lot stronger edges up here, less here, somewhat uh, resembling that, is that we've got oxygen rushing up to fill in this hole that we made first. And the way to test that is to take the oxygen away. You take your sample, you put it in the room lights, you, get a little bit of that. you put it under a lamp, you hit it with about 50 millijoules per centimeter squared of light. It creates radicals, those radicals eat the oxygen. Oxygen is now gone between the last slides, you can't, no more can get in. Do exactly the same experiment. And all of a sudden, all those effects go away. All the lines are exactly the same strength, and the asymmetry has gone away. So if there is no terminator in the material, these non-local go away if there is terminator they're there. Now I can't show you using this effect to make even smaller features because it is we're really trying to tie ourselves up pretty tight at this point with balancing all these effects and time scales. Uh, so I'll show you in the fourth lecture a better idea, which is to bring in a new knob to pattern the material, and that's a second color of light. I think that then is the more talk. Yeah. Um, I have no idea where I have time. Um, but the coffee's working. Um, <laughs> all right, so a little bit more on, on polymer kinetics. Um, for radicals, which are the most common initiator out there, uh, you get this sublinear dependence of the initiation 
on intensity, that makes the drift big, that's bad. Uh, um, you also have this problem that really gives this oxygen problem is, is, is billions of dollars of right now, okay, hundreds of millions of dollars of research have gone into that problem because radical facilities use it like lysum, but when they do radiation curing of coatings, like on these desks, these are probably radiation cured coatings, um, because it's so fast. Um, and it's, it's easier to bring a UV lamp on this than a heat bubble thing and do a thermal coating. But unless you do it in a nitrogen bath, you end up with the top level with lots of oxygen never curing and it's sticky. Um, and so the industrial guys hate this and so they put a lot of money into trying to figure out how to get rid of this oxygen inhibition. So that's it. Um, but what I hope I convinced you, it, it exploit it carefully, because those are good words, um, that you can use the inhibition to narrow your features. And again, exploit it carefully. You can use this sublinear dependence to start to build a binary response in the material where you don't respond outside of some region and you strongly do respond inside of another, and that's good. And you can probably get up to a factor of two ish beyond the diffraction limit like that, which is interesting, not hugely exciting, but interesting. And I'll show you how to get that to the order of magnitude uh, in the last lecture. And then, just because I got to do applications, because I'm an engineer, um, one of the cool things you can do with this is 3D direct write, where you take a focus, you move it around the material, and you've got an ability with diffraction limited, or maybe a little bit smaller than diffraction limited voxels, to be able to create an index of diffraction change on the minus two. Oh, and you can model it in the as well. Um, the reason the reactions are so sensitive